If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 this morning. We will be continuing our series that we have recently started in the book of Judges. And uh, last week we, uh, we looked at 36 verses filled with uh, hard to pronounce names. And so um, I'm offering you a reprieve this morning. We're going to be looking at five verses, five verses this morning. So if you've turned with me, If you will stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God, we will look together at Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. May God's church hear what the Spirit is saying this morning. Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you. But they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, may your word have its complete effect upon your people this morning. Father, I am insufficient for these things, and yet your spirit, your spirit is power. Your word is truth. So, Father, I pray that you will use this weak vessel and that. By your word, through the power of your spirit, you will convict our hearts and draw us to Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's about that time of the year again. In a few weeks... The Oklahoma Baptist newspaper, the Baptist Messenger, will put on its front page how many decisions were made at the Falls Creek Summer Camp this year. That's going to be difficult for them to beat last year's numbers, which were touted as record-breaking, with 6,574 decisions recorded. Now, of those 6,574 decisions, there were 2,580 first-time professions of faith, along with 2,402 rededications. Now, if these numbers were an accurate depiction of the spiritual state of our youth, they would be phenomenal. I mean, think about it. These are Pentecost-level numbers. And yet, each year that there are 2,000-plus professions of faith at Falls Creek alone, We are also told with much lamentation that baptisms are down and that churches are in a poor state of health. Something is amiss in Oklahoma. Something's not lining up between the numbers we're hearing from youth camp and the reports from the churches every year. Now, you may say, George, you shouldn't talk about Falls Creek that way. We are, after all, Southern Baptists. That's our camp. And I don't want you to get the impression that there is nothing good about Falls Creek. There are many people there who genuinely love young people and who genuinely long to see them come to faith in Christ. There are people who have made genuine professions of faith, lasting professions of faith, at Falls Creek. And I have no doubt that God can... And does use False Creek. But the last time I went to False Creek as a sponsor, 
during the time of response, the main speaker said things like, bring your friend down here to the front. If you don't, I'm going to come out there and kick you in the throat. I seem to remember that being Peter's line in Acts chapter 2, wasn't that? I also had the unpleasant experience of witnessing a young lady literally dragging her crying friend who obviously did not want to go down to the front. Those are the kinds of decisions that really stick. If I'm somewhat cynical, I hope you'll bear with me. I hear preachers express a desire for revival in their churches, revival in Oklahoma, revival in America, but I don't think we know what revival really looks like. We associate revival with broken people crying or with thousands of young people lifting their hands. I was at Falls Creek a few, uh, about a month ago, and one of the girls in front of me was on her phone and as soon as the music started, her, her hand was in the air like the Holy Spirit had just hit her. If we believe the preachers on TBN, revival looks like a guy swinging his suit jacket around, knocking people over. Is that genuine revival? Is that what it looks like? Is it happening all around us even now, but we're just too cynical like me to see it? Or does revival consist of something more than our tears? The first great awakening began in America around 1733-1734, and it, it lasted into the 40s. It was a time in which God blessed the preaching of the gospel, and there was a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the hearts of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of colonists were convicted of their sins and they turned to Christ. It was a genuine revival in America. But some of these meetings were also accompanied by people wailing over their sins, shrieking. Some people were falling down on the ground. One of the most, if not the most famous preacher of the First Great Awakening was, of course, Jonathan Edwards. Edwards was a congregational, uh, congregationalist preacher whose influence is still felt today. His sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, was um, maybe the sermon that helped spark the Great Awakening. And though convinced that God was doing a great supernatural work in the colonies, Jonathan Edwards also was suspicious of some of the excesses he saw during this time. He, he heard about people shrieking in the service. He, he heard about people falling over, and, and he was suspicious of these things. He certainly didn't discount emotions. He's quoted as, as saying, the Holy Scriptures do everywhere place religion very much in the affections such as fear, hope, love, hatred, desire, joy, sorrow, gratitude, compassion, and zeal. But he was also quick to point out that not all emotions are Holy Spirit driven. Your emotions can be affected by a a whole variety of different things in your life Things that are going on outside the church all the way to what you ate for breakfast or what you ate for lunch. Your emotions are not the only sign that God is working in your life. We don't want to discount emotions, but we certainly need to examine our emotions. Because if we make some outward signs of emotion are gauge for whether true revival has truly struck... If we make signs such as tears or hands in the air or people streaming down to the front laying face down on the ground as our gauge for genuine revival, then we'll be no better off than Israel in our passage this morning. 
Last week we looked at the difficult and sometimes confusing first chapter of Judges. After Joshua died, Israel looked like they were off to a strong start in conquering the remainder of the promised land. They sought the Lord's will. They followed his guidance. The tribes dwelt in unity and they acted as God's sword of justice against the wicked Canaanites. They were characterized by faithful men like Caleb and Othniel, characterized by faithful women like Aksa. And even believing Gentiles lived among them in peace. But by verse 19 of chapter 1, we begin to see hints that something is seriously wrong in Israel. Judah can't drive out the Canaanites due to their superior weapons, but this is followed by eight times the writer telling us that the other tribes simply did not drive out the Canaanites. They compromised with the inhabitants of the, of the land. They allowed one man to rebuild a conquered city elsewhere. They opted to force the Canaanites into servitude rather than being obedient to God's word in places like Deuteronomy 7 where God tells them to completely drive the Canaanites out of the land. Until by the end of the chapter, the tribe of Dan itself is pushed out of its inheritance, its conquest in reverse. And the consequences of Israel's compromises are beginning to be felt fully. This morning, we're going to see God's response to this compromise. God has not spoken since chapter 1, verse 2. But he has silently allowed Israel to act according to her own desires, according to her own wishes. And we've seen where that's led. And God has been completely quiet Not a peep. But as we'll see now, in chapter 2, God's silence towards our sin does not indicate his approval. But rather, he speaks and disciplines his people precisely when he desires. And so we'll divide these verses into two sections. We'll see in verses 1 through 3, the message from God. The message from God. And then in verses 4 and 5, we'll see the response of Israel. The message of God, the response of Israel. And so let's look again at our text. In verses 1 through 3, we see the message from God. The divine silence is broken. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. The, the author has given us chapter one as a, a straightforward historical narrative. Here's what happened. Judah went and conquered these places. Joseph went and conquered these places. Manasseh didn't, Ephraim didn't, Zebulun didn't, Asher didn't, Naphtali didn't. It's it's just a straight historical narrative without any comments whatsoever. There are, of course, hints throughout the passage which informs us on how we ought to be interpreting these events, but there's nothing explicit. The author doesn't come out and say, look, this is bad. We're simply left to wonder until now. When the angel of the Lord goes up from Gilgal. Gilgal was west of the Jordan River. It's in the promised land. It's right around Jericho. And he travels from Gilgal to Bochum. Now, Gilgal was a very significant location. You can look back at at Joshua chapter 4 and and chapter 5 and see just how significant this location is. After crossing the Jordan River into the promised land, Uh, Joshua set up 12 stones as a memorial. Remember that God parted the Jordan River just like he parted the Red Sea so that the tribes of Israel could walk into the promised land on dry ground. And when they come across uh, Joshua, he takes 12 stones and he builds this monument as a reminder to Israel of what God has done for them. He does this at Gilgal. At Gilgal, they also... Celebrate the Passover, the first Passover in the promised land. 
They also circumcise all of this younger generation because Joshua tells us that they hadn't circumcised their children out in the wilderness. And so now that they're in the promised land, they have come through. God has brought them in. They are on the cusp of conquering the land that, that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, they take the sign of the covenant. They circumcise all the men. They do that at Gilgal. Throughout the rest of Joshua, Gilgal was the staging area for Joshua's military campaigns. He'd start at Gilgal and he'd go conquer a city and he'd come back to Gilgal. And then he'd go to another place and he'd come back to Gilgal. Gilgal was very significant. It was a location of, of heavy theological as well as heavy military significance. It was a city associated with Israel's initial obedience and success. Bochum, where the angel of the Lord travels from Gilgal to Bochum, Bochum is a little more uncertain. But the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, associates it with Bethel. The Septuagint actually says that the angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to Bethel. This would be strengthened by the fact that in verse 5 of our chapter, the people sacrificed to God at Bochum. And towards the end of Judges, in chapter 20, verse 18, and chapter 21, verse 2, it appears that the tabernacle is located in Bethel at this time. So it would make sense if the people are sacrificing to God that they're sacrificing at the tabernacle in Bethel. But if you'll remember, Bethel, or Luz as it was formerly called, was the place in chapter 1, verses 22 through 26, where Israel's compromise began in earnest. The tribe of Joseph, they go to Luz and they seek out the help of one of the inhabitants. They ask him to let, let us in. Tell us how to get in and we'll let you go. Sounds good so far. We're meant, I think, to, to think back to Rahab and Joshua. But then after they conquer the city, they let the man go and he goes and he rebuilds Luz. They conquer the city, but it's not really conquered. It just changes addresses. The compromise begins right there, and everything after the conquest of Luz is this tribe did not conquer. This tribe did not conquer. This tribe did not conquer. And all of a sudden, Dan is being pushed out of the promised land. So from the starting point of Israel's faithful military campaign in Gilgal to the location of their slide in the compromise and unfaithfulness, the angel of the Lord goes up like an army commander inspecting the progress of the campaign. And then he speaks. And his words follow a similar pattern to that which we have already seen in Joshua chapter 24. If you remember two weeks ago, we looked at Joshua's closing words to Israel. The angel of the Lord follows a similar pattern. And he starts by reminding Israel of God's grace in redeeming them from Egypt in verse 1. He swore that he would never be the one to break the covenant. I brought you from Egypt. I brought you into the land. I swore to your fathers. I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. He would remain faithful which is an outstanding statement giving Israel's already sorry history of rebellion and unfaithfulness. From the very moment that Moses was on the top of Mount Sinai receiving the words of the covenant, when Israel was down at the bottom worshiping a golden cow, all through Exodus, all through Numbers, all through Deuteronomy, all we see is Israel unfaithful. And yet God here reminds them, I swore that I would never break my covenant. I wouldn't be the one to turn away. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is a covenant-keeping God. That's what Vacation Bible School is about. If you're wondering about this rainbow behind me, I know that it's very prominent on the video uh, that we release every week. There's a rainbow behind me because we had Vacation Bible School last week. And the theme of Vacation Bible School was the promise-keeping God. And we walked through the covenants that God made with Israel. God, despite all the unfaithfulness of Israel, despite all of their waywardness, despite all their compromise, God is faithful. God's not the one who's turning away. It's Israel. 
But despite them entering into a covenant, despite God's faithfulness, Israel has covenant obligations. We see that in verse 2. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall break down their altars. This is directly from places like Exodus 23, verses 23 through 33. Exodus 34, verses 11 through 16. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. God wasn't ambiguous. He was very clear. Make no covenants with the people in the land. Tear down their altars. And in these other places that I cited, he also tells them not to intermarry, which would go along with making no covenants with them. Don't enter into any kind of relationship with these people. And he was clear as to the reason. They'll cause you to worship other gods. Don't enter into a relationship with them. Tear down their altars or you will find yourself worshiping their gods right alongside them. And this is exactly what we see in the second half of verse 2. The angel of the Lord says, you have not obeyed my voice. You have not obeyed my voice. They... The the implication here is that they have entered into covenants with the people. Beginning infamously with the covenant with the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9 and extending to other groups. They have entered into covenants with the people. It's quite possible that they entered into covenants with the, the Canaanites promising to spare their lives in exchange for the servitude that we find the Canaanites in. Verses 128 and following. You serve us, we won't kill you. Sounds like a good deal. But they've entered into covenants exactly as God told them not to. They haven't broken down the altars of these false gods. The Canaanites worshipped a whole plethora of gods. Bel and Asheroth and, and the whole pantheon. And God told them, I'm the only God. Tear down their altars lest you worship these other gods. But Israel has not obeyed God's voice. Hey, if one God is good, why not a few more? Can't hurt. Especially since the the God Baal is the God of rain and fertility. What if Yahweh takes a long nap during the season in which we need rain for our wheat fields? What if my wife is barren and Yahweh's on vacation? What if Yahweh lets me down? I need a backup plan and the Canaanites have Baal. The angel of the Lord, he doesn't mince words. He he says in a cry of sorrow, What is this that you have done? What is this that you have done? God has redeemed them out of slavery. He has brought them into the promised land. He has sworn covenant faithfulness. He's demonstrated that faithfulness time and time and time again. And they respond to God's grace by showing contempt to God's clear word. They've seen God's power even up to that day. And they have spurned him and compromised with the Canaanites. They have despised him. They have not delighted in God, but they have delighted in in all the products that they find in the land of Canaan. And you may think to yourself, I don't see what the big deal is. Sure, they didn't drive the Canaanites out completely. They didn't kill them all. But really, if we really think about it, that was was really barbaric anyway. So really, they're they're just showing some kindness to the Canaanites by not forcing them out. And besides, they... They didn't just let them have free reign. They forced them into servitude. They they forced them to, to serve them. It works, right? Israel wins. They're, they're firmly in control. What's the big deal? Well, 
chapter 1, beginning at verse 22, and going through the rest of the chapter, reeks of pragmatism. It reeks of pragmatism. It's a way to rationalize sin. It treats God's word like suggestions. Well, if it works, then it's okay if we don't follow it to the letter. It views disobedience as, well, at least it gets the job done. We're not so different from the Israelites, are we? We appeal to logic and what works just like they did. We compromise for the sake of success. We explain away our sin. We do it in moral areas and we do it in theological areas. In the moral areas of our life, Well, yeah, I know Game of Thrones has a lot of nudity and sex, but I just fast forward through those parts. And besides, it it gives me conversation starters with my co-workers. And I don't want to come across as a a holier-than-thou prude. One of the reasons I don't recommend the Gospel Coalition like I used to is that they keep posting articles like why the Oscars matter to Christians. I don't care about that. They don't really matter. Not really. We compromise in moral areas. We compromise in theological areas. I know Joel Osteen doesn't teach the Bible correctly, but he just says a lot of nice things. And he's always smiling. And I just don't see what's so bad about that. Or, well, the, the preacher spent more time telling stories than teaching from the Bible, but at least he's getting people in the pews. And... There's no harm in that, is there? And then not only do we compromise, we rationalize just like the Israelites. We need Yahweh and the Baals, because what if Yahweh lets me down? What if he's not there when I need him? I know God will take care of me, but I also need to work 60 plus hours a week to make sure I can retire on time. I know God's in control, but we won't be at church this week because my son has a ball game and, you know, he needs to play as much as possible so he can get into a good college. And what if God won't provide? What if God's not there? We've got to have a backup plan. It sounds logical, and in many cases it works. We call it success. The angel of the Lord calls it disobedience. And until we stop rationalizing our sin, we will never see genuine revival. And yet God extends even more grace. Israel has violated the clear word of God. It's not even a question. And yet he still sends his messenger. The very fact that he sends the angel of the Lord to them is evidence of further grace. They don't deserve it. They don't really need it. They've got Moses' words. They can read it on the paper. And yet he still extends more grace to them by sending the angel of the Lord. Who says in verse 3, Now I say I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides and their God shall be a snare to you. Now that you've left them there, it's like you've you've left a trap laying there. We had a mouse in our house last week. Drove me crazy. I could not catch this thing. Finally caught it the other night. But we laid traps everywhere. And what do we tell the kids? Don't touch those traps. And what do those kids do? They touch those traps, right? This is what Israel does. Those altars, they're traps. They're right there. You can see them. What does Israel do? Oh, I think I'll go over and touch this trap. But the verse actually reads a little more ambiguously in the Hebrew. If you're using the King James or the New American Standard or or even the New 
uh, NIV. It says something like, Therefore I also said I will not drive them out before you. Or, or and I have also said I will not drive them out before you. It's, it's more of a statement than a declaration. In the ESV, it, it's a declaration. Now this is what I'm going to do. But actually in the Hebrew, it's more of a statement. It's more of a reminder. Remember, I said, break down the altars. And remember, I also said, if you don't, I'm not going to drive them out. It's a reminder of the covenant curses. It's a reminder of of places like Numbers 33, 55, and Joshua 23, verses 12 and 13. But mixed in with this threat is also the idea that there's time to repent. It's not too late. Remember what I said. Repent. God does not merely frighten us with the threat of the law, but he also extends hands of grace to those who would receive it. He is a gracious, covenant-keeping God. He is a faithful, loving Savior to those who will repent. That's the message. In verses 4 and 5, we have Israel's response. We see their outward signs of repentance. The angel of the Lord reminds the people of the consequences of their sin, so how do they respond? Look at what it says. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, which means weepers. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. It's four things you can notice here. As soon as they hear the word, they, they let no time lapse. They hear the word, they respond to it. They lift up their voices and they weep. The, the Jewish people were more demonstrative than most of us would be comfortable with. Their, their common practice of, of mourning or, or when they were in distress was to, to tear their clothes and to throw dust and ash up in the air and, and, and then wail. We could do with more tears and mourning over our sins. We're hardly moved by anything these days, and heaven forbid that someone should see me doing it. What would they think? What would they think if they saw me crying? What would they think if they saw me in tears? I think too often we listen to God's word with dry eyes. And not to leave myself out, I think too often I preach with dry eyes. But Israel responds with tears. They rename the place Bochum. They, it's called weeping. They, they actually uh, define the entire location by this event. And then they sacrifice. Again, probably because the tabernacle was located there. They respond with the the sacrifices prescribed by the law of Moses. Weeping, identifying the place with a genuine religious experience, sacrificing, this all looks good. This all looks good. It looks like the, the, the message has hit home. But notice the one thing that's missing. There's something missing in their response. They weep, they rename the place, they offer sacrifices, but there's, there's one thing that's missing. There's no mention that when they're done weeping and sacrificing that they went and tore down the altars. There's no mention that they renewed their campaign against the Canaanites. There's, there's no mention of repentance. There's no sign of repentance. Sure, they, they're crying. Sure, they're going through the motions. But look down to verses 11 through 13. And look at what it says. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. 
They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were, where? Around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. It's all still there. Their actions of verses 4 and 5 are shallow. It's all a farce. It's a two-verse revival. It's gone as soon as it starts. It's fueled by guilt from the message from the angel, but it's gone. But but what about all the weeping? What about the sacrificing? God makes it very clear throughout the rest of the Bible that he wants more than Israel's religious activities. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 and following. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's case. Turn with me to Joel, Joel chapter 2. If you find Ezekiel and Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Small book, it's only three chapters. Look at Joel chapter 2. God is threatening a locust invasion. And the locust invasion really is just a metaphor for the Babylonian army that's about to come in. God is going to send judgment against his people. But look at what it says in chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting with weeping and with mourning. See, he doesn't, he doesn't discount these things, but it has to go further and rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend your hearts. Don't, don't go through the motions of tearing your clothes. Tear your hearts up over your sin. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist is, well, doing what his name implies. He's baptizing. He's at the Jordan. And all the people are coming to him. And even the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming to be baptized. The religious elite of Israel. And he turns and he sees them and he says, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's not a very popular invitation, right? Who warned you to to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't just go through the motions of being baptized and then go back and keep sinning. Repent and bear fruit that's keeping with repentance. Paul tells the Corinthians the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses 8 through 11. He says, Even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. Paul 
has written a letter to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians are a terrible church. No matter how bad this church might be, it doesn't even get close to Corinth. And he wrote a letter rebuking them, pointing out their sin. And he says, it grieved you, and and it hurt me to see you grieve. But, But it also gave me joy, because your grief led you to repentance. He goes on to say, you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There's two kinds of grief. There's worldly grief that's driven by guilt, and it may even have outward signs of weeping and and mourning and, and going through religious motions, but it leads ultimately to death. Paul says there is godly grief that leads to salvation. And it's not just found in outward emotions. It's not just found in going through religious activities. He says in verse 11, For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. But also what eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. What did they do? They repented by their actions. Their actions showed that they truly were grieved over their sin and they, they, they turned away from their sin so that they might follow Christ. If all our repentance produces is eye water, then it's not true repentance. It's emotionalism disguised as religious activity. It looks good, but it has no lasting results. It's not to say that emotions are bad. Not at all. We we ought to feel sorrow. We ought to feel grief over sin. But if that sorrow doesn't lead to a change in your life, then it doesn't mean anything at all. And it does you no good. Jonathan Edwards, remember, he was suspicious about all these these excesses during the Great Awakening. And so he wrote a book called Religious Affections. And in it, he gave some marks of genuine revival. What does it look like when revival actually hits? What does repentance truly look like? Here's five marks that he gives of genuine revival. The first one is that genuine revival leads to an elevated level of esteem for Jesus. When the Holy Spirit impacts your life, the Holy Spirit reveals and glorifies Jesus. Jesus is the focus. If you watch these charlatans on TV that are claiming that that God is working in their midst, their focus is all on the supposed works of the Holy Spirit. People falling down and and weeping and and speaking in gibberish and, and twitching and And all kinds of strange things. That's their their proof. But the Holy Spirit, the Scripture says, doesn't glorify itself. It glorifies Jesus. And so any movement, any, any spiritual event that doesn't lead to a a higher, elevated regard for Jesus is false. And not some fantasy Jesus, not some Jesus of our making, but the historical, biblical Jesus. The second mark of genuine revival, according to Jonathan Edwards, is that genuine revival works against the interest of Satan's kingdom. Genuine revival is not interested in some religious experience and in going home and doing exactly the same things that you did before you came. Genuine revival means that it works in you a hatred of sin and a pursuit of holy living. It's a transformation. The third sign, according to Edwards, is that genuine revival leads to a greater regard for holy scriptures. Edwards and others were constantly having to fight against groups like the Quakers that encouraged people to sit there and just look for the inner light For when God speaks to you within your heart, genuine revival doesn't lead to looking for some inner feeling or listening for some inner voice. It leads to a hunger for God's word. 
Don't look for what, what will God say at some point down here? What has God already said right here in this book? A lot of churches already claim to have that, but the level of ignorance of the Bible that is evident today proves that we are still looking for genuine revival to come. It will lead us forward to a greater hunger for God's word. The fourth mark of genuine revival is that genuine revival is revealed by the words that we use addressing the opposite ideas or the opposite spirits. In other words, how do we speak about the lies and the contrary ideas to the gospel? Do we just let them coexist? Do we look at, at what the Bible actually says and say, well, Joel Osteen's good too. Joyce Myers is okay. Jesus calling, where you're just listening for Jesus to speak directly to you, that's okay. True revival doesn't allow for a cavalier attitude towards the truth. Genuine revival, it, it has a zealous, a zealous pursuit towards the biblical truth, even if it causes controversy. And the fifth mark of genuine revival, according to Jonathan Edwards, is that genuine revival leads to a spirit of love to God and men. It leads to genuine love towards God and genuine love towards others. It's true experiential religion. It's delighting in God and loving the church as well and seeking the well-being of others. See, the Israelites, by allowing the Canaanites to stay and to continue uh, worshiping, and building their own altars, instead of tearing them down, it's showing that the Israelites were not delighting in God. They weren't rejoicing in God as their supreme hope, as their supreme love. And they weren't loving their neighbors. But genuine revival leads to a a delighting in God and to loving others. In other words, genuine revival and, and true repentance is not demonstrated in simply feeling guilt over sin or walking an aisle or saying a prayer. It's not even crying. True repentance is shown in a changed life. The Holy Spirit actually works change in your life. There's a transformation. The drunkard puts away his drink. The guy looking at pornography throws his computer away. The girl sleeping around seeks purity. The thief stops stealing. The liar stops lying. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Genuine repentance, genuine revival leads to radical transformation. The message, the response... In our look at this passage, I have intentionally overlooked one crucial aspect. But we must turn to it now. The message, the response. What about the messenger? What about the messenger? Who is the angel of the Lord? Since the Hebrew term malak can be translated as either angel or messenger... Some commentators prefer to see this as a human messenger, a prophet. But the angel of the Lord is found in several places in the book of Judges. And in Judges chapter 6, a prophet and the angel of the Lord appears, and there is a distinction. And so I think it is best to see the angel of the Lord as a heavenly being. And he appears in three other places in Judges. I think it's safe to view him as something more than a human. So why not simply see him as an angel, as the text puts it? It says angel of the Lord. Why not, why not just say he's an angel? Ah, here's where it gets interesting. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, remember Moses is drawn aside by the burning bush. And the text says that the angel of the Lord speaks to Moses out of the burning bush. And yet in the rest of that encounter, the rest of that dialogue between Moses, it says that Yahweh himself is speaking. Notice in our text 
That when the angel of the Lord speaks, he doesn't begin with the formula, thus says the Lord. Look back at Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, and you'll see Joshua begins his statement by saying, thus says the Lord. The angel here doesn't say that. Instead, throughout his message, he says, I. I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. In fact, as we go through the book of Judges and we we get to chapter 13, Samson's parents encounter the angel of the Lord. And after the angel of the Lord disappears, Manoah, Samson's father, says, we have seen God. The angel of the Lord throughout other places, other instances, he is identified as Yahweh. But in Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 and 23, God says he will send his angel before Israel, who will drive out the Canaanites and who will have Yahweh's name in him. I think that given this description in Exodus 23, that that there's good reason to see the angel of the Lord as the commander of Yahweh's army in Joshua chapter 5. And the angel of the Lord there receives Joshua's worship. He acts as Yahweh, he speaks as Yahweh, and yet he also is distinct from Yahweh. I wonder, is your spidey sense tingling any? What does the New Testament say? Jude Jude verse 5. Jude says, Jesus saved a people out of the land of Egypt and afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Who saved the people out of Egypt? Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul says, They all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. The apostles have no problem with seeing the Son of God as active and present in the Exodus events. And I think the evidence is very strong, if not overwhelming, that the angel of the Lord is, in fact, a pre-incarnate form of Christ. Now, what that does not mean, and I, I want you to hear me, I don't want there to be any confusion, what that does not mean is that Christ is a created being like other angels. We read that term, angel of the Lord, and we think, I can't be Jesus because Jesus isn't an angel. Don't be confused. I'm not saying that Jesus is an angel. He is called an angel or messenger of the Lord. But make no, make no mistakes. He is the eternal, uncreated second person of the Trinity. He is the co-equal son of God. And he will appear several more times in this book. And I think when we read Angel of the Lord, we ought to see that the Son of God himself is coming. But what does it mean here? I mean, why go through all this trouble to identify Christ here? You, you may have checked out about five minutes ago. So what does it mean? Who cares? I think to say this, he's right there. He's right there. He's right in front of them. The one to whom all their sacrifices pointed, standing there speaking to them. Here he is preaching the terror of the law to them. But he also extends grace. Grace to Israel and grace to us. The same one who here reminds Israel of all the curses of the law. Who reminds them that if they are unfaithful that the curses will come upon them. The same one here who's reminding them of the curses will also, in the fullness of time, step into Israel's history, clothing himself in humanity, fulfilling the righteous demands of the law, and then dying under the curse of the law. The curse that they deserve. The curse that we deserve. 
He dies under the curse for us. He's right there. And they missed him. And they missed him. Their repentance lasts for two verses. Will we miss him too? He's right there. He's speaking. Will we miss him also? Or are we doomed to Israel's fate? Will we follow the cycle that we will find next week in Judges? Or will we heed the voice of the Son of God? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. I think even now as we hear the words of of the pre-incarnate Son of God speaking to Israel, reminding them of their their covenant obligations and confronting them in their sin and and warning them of the the disaster that's that's on the horizon. Even now, we can hear Christ speaking to the church of, of Sardis in Revelation 3 when he says, you have the reputation of being alive. It looks like you're successful. It looks like you've done everything right. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Hear his voice today. Hear his voice speaking to you today. Don't harden your hearts. He's calling to you. Repent and believe the gospel. Don't try to rationalize your sin. Don't try to explain it away. Don't don't try to say, well, at least it works. Call sin what it is. See it for the demonic nature that it truly is. Hear the words of the Son of God. The one who, who dies under the curse of the law for sinners and who lives and reigns forevermore, and He extends grace to everyone who will receive Him. Examine yourself. Examine yourselves. I think that we are so quick to listen to sermons, and then as soon as the the service is over, we jump up and we're gone. Or we jump up and we turn around, we're immediately in conversation with someone else. Examine yourself. Meditate upon this. Think about this. Is your repentance genuine or are you simply going through the religious motions? Heed the voice of the Son of God. And may God grant His people genuine repentance. And may we see genuine revival in our days. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let's pray.